morning. It's wonderful. I hope that you brought your Bibles. I hope that you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the church at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a big city. Ephesus was a huge city in its pride. Ephesus boasted a population of 300,000 people. 300,000 people in the ancient world. And in that city was one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana, or the Temple of Artemis. And people in that city made all kinds of money off of that temple. It was known there as a place of banking. It was known there as a place of wealth. It was a center for idolatry. And the people of this city, morality was non-existent. They had a subjective morality. Well, what's right for you may not be what's right for me. What's right over here may not be what's right over there. And it kind of just depends. It was a city that was morally bankrupt. They had no... No fervor in anything that they did. It was just whatever I want to do today, that's what I'm going to do. And Paul experienced much evil in this city. If you would, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32, he says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me? If the dead rise not, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He says, In the city of Ephesus, they treated me like animals. He said they were violent. They were brute animals towards me. So he says, listen, what advantage does it have me if the dead do not rise and I go through this? Think back for just a moment where Paul come from. Paul was a Pharisee. So Paul says, listen, I had prominence. I had wealth. I had power. I had authority. I had a good living. I had a nice house, friends and family. I had all sorts of things. He says, what advantage do I have for giving all of that up if the dead don't rise? He says, why would I sit there and go, you know what, I'm just going to pretend I saw Christ on the road to Damascus and just give up all the wonderful things that I have in this life. For eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If that's the case, why would I give all of that up? In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 through 9, he says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. He says, in the city of Ephesus, there, are, there is a field white to harvest, but at the same time, there are enemies lying in wait who cannot wait to get a hold of us. There are adversaries. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 9, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 9, he says, For we would not, brethren, have you be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. They pushed down on us. <laughs> Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. He says they pushed and they pressed and they pounded on us until it felt like we were going to die. They were everywhere. The Ephesian temple of Artemis ranked seventh in the wonders of, of the world, or, or was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was huge. It was masterfully crafted. It gave the temple... Managers, how? It gave the temple managers money. In fact, they were called the bankers of the whole wide world. Sound familiar? They were called the bankers of the whole wide world. Everyone went to them for money. The currency was bound there. They made silver. They were, they were wealthy. The principal industry at Ephesus was manufacturing and selling those little gold images, or those little silver images. They would make of Diana. And you want to buy one of these images? People don't change. They're selling food and images at a tourist spot. What do you think? People don't change. It was here to this city that Paul is going to begin to write the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. He's writing a warning to them, a message to them. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Read, read, read with me if you would. He says unto the angel of the church at Ephesus, write. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Jesus Christ is always in the midst of his people. He's always watching over his people. He was there with them. He knew what they were going through. He knew what they were dealing with. And as much as he knows what they're going through and what they were dealing with, he knows what we're going through and what we're dealing with in life. He says, I know thy works. He knew what they were doing and what they weren't doing. They had worked hard. They had been loyal in many things. He knows that he knows if a congregation is faithfully upholding truth or not. 
He knows if a congregation is faithfully teaching the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He knows if we're doing that or not. He's watching. He sees these things. What if you or I was the very last Christian alive? No one else, just us. What if we were the last congregation in the world? The last faithful congregation in the world. Could we be trusted with the truth? If everyone else has been put to death, everyone else has turned their back, could we be trusted to keep going on with the truth? That's one of the questions. Yeah. Jesus knows if a congregation is performing its mission. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, For the perfecting of the saints unto the work of ministry and unto the building up of the body of Christ. Paul is giving a summary of the work of the church. It's edifying its members. It's supposed to be helping those in times of need and converting the lost. He knows the true spiritual condition of a church. He knows if a congregation is like a city on a hill that's shining to all the world or if it's like a candle being put under a basket hiding within the four walls afraid to go out into the world. Amen. He knows which one we are. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he says, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Now I want you to notice, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. They too lived in the middle of a crooked and a perverse nation. He says, Among whom you shine is life to the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither have labored in vain. He says, I want you to keep running even though you live in the middle of a perverse nation. Christ says to them, I know thy patience. They have refused evil things, even though they were surrounded by those who were doing wicked things. Two days ago was the anniversary of Roe v. Wade in the United States, and since then, 58 million babies have been killed. That's more than the population of several states. 58 million. Fornication of all types is encouraged and glorified. So did Rome. Alcohol is one of our nation's favorite drinks. So too was it in Rome. Hard drugs are very common in our society. Domestic violence is common occurrence in our society. So too was it in Rome. Cur cursing is filtered into every single channel. You can't even watch the news anymore. It's everywhere. Right. So too was it in Rome. Amen. The nation went on standby as a man in a white uniform with a pointy hat and a stick performed magic tricks and landed in the United States. And everyone was saying, oh, how holy he is. Wait a minute. That's an idolatrous teaching, isn't it? To call him Holy Father. To call him Father at all. Who is our Holy Father? God is our Holy Father. The nation around us is wicked. Atheism is paraded as science in our classroom. Philosophy was the same thing to them then. Darwin is glorified in our schools for writing the origin of species, while completely ignoring all the racism found in his other books. We live in the middle of a crooked and a perverse nation as well. And since that is the case, we cannot the, the, let the wickedness of a nation around us influence us. We should be the influence to them. We should be the light upon the hill, not letting the darkness overtake us, but being the shining light to the world. In Acts chapter 20, he's writing something to the elders. But since we don't have elders, he's writing it to the men of the congregation here. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, I, I besought thee still to abide in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine." Interesting thing here. He charged Timothy to teach them. Don't teach any other doctrine. And they, they held to that. They didn't teach any other doctrine. They were firm in that. 
But there's something else that's going to happen to them. We talk about Laodicea a lot because Laodicea became a lukewarm church. But he's telling them, or he's going to be warning them about the church at Ephesus becoming a cold church, not lukewarm. Amen. In 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So he says, when someone brings you something, you make sure what they're saying is true. Look it up. Follow along. If I'm preaching, I want you to follow right along with me. I may go too fast sometimes. But if I'm preaching, I want you to follow along with me and make sure what I'm saying is true. Because if I got something wrong, I want you to tell me. I need to know. The church at Ephesus stood up strongly against false teachers. The church at Ephesus spoke out against those who would pervert the doctrine of Christ. The church at Ephesus was strong in the doctrine of Christ. The church in Ephesus would not allow error to be taught from their pulpit or in their classrooms. We might call them a sound congregation today if that is all that we knew about the church in Ephesus. Verse 3, he says, And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. He continues to compliment their strengths and accomplishments. They had not given up. It would be easy to compromise a little bit in Ephesus, wouldn't it? It would be easy to let them influence you in Ephesus. It's a huge city. Just don't say sin is sin and we'll get along just fine. Just don't say Christians are the only people going to heaven and we'll get along just fine. It would have been very easy for the church in Ephesus to compromise a little bit. Don't be quite so narrow-minded and leave the door open to exceptions and we will be but God said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, he tells us, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them who are of the household of faith. He says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't let them drag you down. Don't let them beat you down. Don't get weary. Don't get tired of doing the right thing. The congregation had a history of activity in the Lord's church. They had went through hardships. They served their master. They endured faithfully. They faced tribulation. They had not, or they had, begun to grow weary in service. The danger of growing weak is very real. These brethren had began to falter. At some point, the Lord was talking to them, the Lord was telling them, you have done many, many, many wonderful things in my kingdom. You've been faithful to my truth, you've been faithful to my word, but there's something else about to take place. Verses 4 and 5, he says, nevertheless, even though all of these things, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. He says, you've got the ability to call people out. He encouraged them and built them up for the things that they've done, but they had left their first love. Now there may not have been any appearance of this. You may not have been able to walk into that congregation and see this necessarily. He said they had begun, or they had left their first love. Jesus, the great physician, knew of an internal struggle they were having. They continued to labor. They continued to endure. They didn't allow false teachers to teach. They were doing their duty, but they were doing it without love or without the degree of love for Christ. <coughs> They were doing it without their initial love and fervor that they had. Without a fervent love for Christ, if I want to be with Him more than I want to be anything else in this world, if I want to see the Grand Canyon more than I want to see Christ, I'm doing it wrong. He says that has to be first and foremost, because if that's not number one in my mind, I will never treat my brothers and sisters right. And if I never treat my brothers and sisters right, I will definitely never treat the world right. And if I don't treat the world right, then you know that I don't care if they go to heaven or not. So first and foremost, a fervent love for Christ. And if I have a fervent love for Christ, I must have a fervent love for service. Perfect love casts out fear. We cannot be afraid to serve. We must leave our comfort zones and serve Him when it makes me nervous. I don't think I have the talent to do something. I didn't used to think I had the talent to lead singing. 
used to be terrified. But I did it once, and you know what happened? I learned I could do it. I didn't breathe a lot, but I learned I could do it. <laughs> and the more I did it, the easier it got. That's with anything in life. The more I do something, the easier it gets. I didn't think I had the talent to speak publicly. I was convinced I didn't. First time I stood up to preach, I forgot the person's name I'd known for years. I just looked at him and said, thank you, brother. <laughs> I forgot the name. And then I spoke at a thousand miles per hour. And I was done in ten minutes. <laughs> but the more I do something, the easier it becomes. And that's for all of us. Regardless of what it is. The first time you drive a car, you're going to scare the person to death that's sitting next to you. Amen. But the more you do it, the better you will be at it. When it comes to service to God, the more I do something, the better I will be at it. But for me to start doing something more, I have to start doing it. Perfect love casts out fear. It tells us not to be afraid anymore. What am I afraid of? Am I afraid somebody's going to say something about me if I mess up? Can't be afraid of that. Am I afraid that I may make a mistake? That happens. We all make mistakes. But that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we move forward. Perfect love casts out fear. There is no one in this room who is incapable of doing anything. Amen. Because if we were in, unable to do it, God wouldn't have told us to do it. Amen. We are capable. Would Jesus tell us to do something we can't do? Absolutely not. I may not want to. It may scare me. It may make me uncomfortable. It may make my mind go 10,000 miles per hour. But if I am commanded to do it, I have to do it. Amen. And if I don't do it, I can never expect my children to do it. Amen. Service extends to those outside of these four walls as well by helping the local community. He commands us to be servants of His and therefore servants of the world. Without a fervent love for worship and Bible study and godliness and prayer and soul winning, I will never measure up to the Lord's standards. Amen. God commands and demands that we be all in. He wants us to be 100% in. If we're not all in, we will find ourselves all out. All right. God's always wanted the best, isn't he? Amen. When it comes to his sacrifices, he's wanted the best. He wants all of us. He wants our hearts and our actions and our minds. He doesn't want just our hearts and not our actions, or just our actions and not our hearts. He wants everything from us. Amen. God gives them this warning for forgetting their mission and the reason behind their mission. Christianity is not about going around bashing people 24-7. Christianity is not just about standing up to false teachers. Christianity is about Jesus Christ giving his life upon the cross of Calvary for you and for me when it should have been us. Christianity is about the forgiveness of God. It's about the love of God. It's about the grace of God and how we as a people have been forgiven. How we as a people have been loved and how we as a people should share that good news with others. Because that's the message of the gospel. That's what the gospel means, the good news. I'm no longer under the law of Moses. I'm not under the patriarchal law. I'm not under any idol worship. I'm not under any of those things. I've been set free from my sin. I was under sin. I was a servant of sin. But now I'm a servant of Christ. Amen. That's what Christianity is about. But the wealthy, cultured, sinful nature of the Ephesians had affected the saints. The Ephesians were pushing and pushing and pushing and the Ephesians... The our brothers and sisters in Ephesus were starting to get weary and well-doing. They had done what millions today deny is even possible. They were starting to fall away from Christ. Amen. This fall would be fatal unless they repented. Godly sorrow produces repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow was me being genuinely sorry for the thing that I've done and changing because I want to be right with God. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry I got caught. It's 
not about being sorry that I got caught. It's about being sorry that I've done something wrong. It's about being sorry that I've sinned against God. It's about being sorry that the reason He's on the cross is because of my sin. That's godly sorrow that work of repentance because it causes me to change. It causes me to move. It causes me to do something because of what He's done for me. That's godly sorrow. Unless they repented, the Lord would come and remove their candlestick. He would take away their identity as Christians because they were not being Christians. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. He says in verse 6, But this thou hast, thou that hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We don't know a lot about the Nicolaitans. We know that they loved to drink, they loved to party, they loved fornication, they loved excess. That's about all we know about them. He says in verse 7, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He says, if you have ears, I want you to listen to them. Now there are those who have ears but can't hear. And there are those that have eyes but can't see because they've let so much of the world blind them to the truth. He says, if you're willing to listen, listen close. If you're willing to listen, let me have your ear for just a second and hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you overcome, you will find yourself in the paradise of God. Amen. However, there is a converse to that. If I don't overcome, if I give in, there's no way that I can find myself in His paradise. He says, listen, I understand that the world is hard. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but is in all points tempted like as we are. Yet without sin. So Christ can say, I understand what it's like to be in that body. I've been in that body. I understand what it's like to have people tempt you. When they slap me in the face and spit in my face. And they told me to perform a miracle. I know what it's like to be embarrassed. I know what it's like to have that feeling inside of you. I know what it's like to feel pain. I was nailed upon that cross. I was beaten with lashes. I had that crown of thorn in my head. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be tempted by Satan. I put on that flesh, and he tempted me. I know what that's like. He says, if we overcome, we will have access to the paradise of God. A new body. A body that isn't decaying. A body that doesn't get old. A body that doesn't get sick. A body that doesn't get tired where tears are wiped away, where death no longer exists, where we will ever be with the Lord, seeing Him face to face. Isn't that where you want to be? Amen. That's where I want to be. He that has an ear, let him hear. To overcome, we must first become a Christian. Amen. To overcome, we must first be saved. Amen. By the grace of God, we must be saved. Without that grace, there is no salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God. It's not because I'm wonderful. It's not because I do all sorts of good things. It's because He was willing to go to that cross for me. Do you believe that? Because if I believe that, it's going to cause me to change. For godly sorrow, work of repentance. If I truly believe He went to the cross for me, it's going to cause me to change my life for Him. That's repentance. It's going to cause me to stand up and say, this is the truth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's me confessing Him before mankind. Regardless of what you say about me, regardless of how you treat me, what you do to me, I have to be true to Him. And I must be willing to be baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. 1 Peter 3.21 The like figure where to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not just getting wet. It's not that this is holy water. It's special water. It's not that. It's water that runs right out of the faucet. You can see it. But it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. It's me saying, this is what God expects of me. This is what God wants me to do. So that's what I'm going to do because He said it. Amen. That's what baptism is. Amen. It's me being buried with Him in death and being raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. That sound familiar like anything else Jesus ever said? 
You have to die, be buried, and you must be born again. And then once we become Christian, we look forward to that home, that home in heaven. We look forward to the place we never leave. We look forward to the paradise of God. But sometimes along the way we might get stumbled up like the Ephesians. We might let the world push and push and push till we get depressed. We might let the world push and push and push until we start compromising a little bit here, compromising a little bit there. But he says when we start to compromise, that's when we start to get cold. That's when we start to die as a congregation. He says we can't be cold. We can't be lukewarm. We have to be all in or all out. Amen. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that needs to make a change in their life. If you're not a New Testament Christian, do you want to see the paradise of God? There's only one way to do it. And that's by following Him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Or perhaps you become a New Testament Christian and you let that world get to you. Then come now, while we stand, while we sing. There's a stranger at the door. Let